Okay. Welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer O'Neill and we are so glad that you could all join us this evening. Many of you know, as part of our local program here, the League of Women Voters of Evanston is participating in the review of the State League's proposed revision to the criminal justice positions. Our criminal justice system is not only ineffective, but unjust in many ways. And the League position statement needs to be updated to support our advocacy. This evening's program is part of our efforts to understand the issues, and we are pleased to have an outstanding speaker to help us with that this evening. Our Criminal Justice Reform Committee has placed background materials on our website, and we encourage you to review that information for each of the 14 consensus questions, which we considered in January. So I'm gonna turn it over now to one of our committee members, Lois Taft. Um, she will introduce our speaker and moderate the program this evening. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Rudell. He's the Director of Criminal Justice Policy with the a uh, CLU of uh, Illinois. He's responsible for drafting and analyzing criminal justice legislation and lobbying in the Illinois General Assembly. Ben joined the ACLU of Illinois in April 2015 after more than seven years in the office of the Illinois House Minority Leader, during which time he held the position of Deputy Legal Counsel and staffed the Judiciary and Criminal Law Committees. Prior to his work in the legislature, Ben practiced law in Chicago. Ben is originally from Peoria, Illinois, and he graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a degree in political science and received his law degree from the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign. He lives in Chicago and is a member of the Illinois Bar. He also uh, has given uh, us permission to send uh, his PowerPoint to the people attending the program uh, so you don't have to worry uh, about trying to write everything down. Uh, I will now turn the program over to Ben. Thank you for being here. Uh, hi, uh, good evening. My name is Ben Riddell. Uh, um, thanks for the nice introduction and thank you all for, um, for having me as your guest and uh, uh, listening to the things I have to say uh, this evening. Um, so, um, as Lois said, most of our, uh, most of my work is focused in, in the state legislature and, um, focused on, uh, a fairer, juster criminal legal system than we have now. And, um, uh, one of the areas that I've focused a lot of time on in the five years now, five years plus that I've been with the ACLU is in the area of sentencing uh, reform. Um, our and sentence could I, could I inter uh, interrupt for just a second? I, I meant sure. to tell the members that uh, we will take questions at the end of Ben's presentation, and we ask you to put any questions you have in the chat. Continue, Ben. Oh, thank you. Um, so, um, I'm gonna, I have a presentation this evening that I'm gonna share with you that's focused on sentencing reform and what we believe uh, needs to happen as far as um, right sizing the penalties. And so, so not so many people go to prison and the people who go to prison aren't staying for so long, um, which enables us to have take a more uh, targeted rehabilitative approach with those who are there. Um, I, I understand that um, some folks are also interested in hearing about um, pre-trial issues, specifically the issue of um, bond reform, which is a, an Please area we on. work in also. Um, so I can, um, after I, uh, the presentation on sentencing, I can say a few words about um, our work there. But um, right now I'm going to uh, share my screen if I can do that. And uh, um, I have a PowerPoint that I can run through just to talk to you a little bit about why we think sentencing reform is important what is essential to um, to doing that in a comprehensive way and share some specific proposals that we have um, to accomplish that. So I'm going to share my screen right 
now. Um, can everyone see? Okay, I see your head's nodding. So um, I think um, just to get us off on the, the right foot or to center this discussion where it needs to be, we need to understand that what we do in this country is not normal with regard to incarceration. And so this um, chart compares us, uh, the United States, uh, very unfavorably to other countries as far as the sheer number of our own people we incarcerate, um, as well as the rate at which we incarcerate our own our own people. So, you know, both of those um, categories, we are um, far exceeding countries like China, Russia, um, every other country in the world uh, by a wide margin. And Illinois is um, no exception. We're, we're uh, very typical. Uh, and um, so when did this happen? It happened um, starting in the 1970s and, um, you know, the incarceration rate was uh, really um, took off in the late 70s and didn't taper off um, and start going down again until um, the 2000s. And so we're still at a very high rate from just these several decades of very rapid growth. Um, and uh, this, right now we're looking at the US um, population writ large, but Illinois basically followed the same same traje trajectory, excuse me, um, starting in the 70s going up and then just now uh, in the last few years starting to taper off. So in 74, we had 6,000 people in our state prisons. Today we have uh, almost 32,000. Um, and we were in, in about 2013, we had close to 50,000, um, which was the peak. Um, an important thing to understand about incarceration um, nationwide is that most of the people who are incarcerated are in state prisons or local jails, um, as opposed to the federal system. So when you hear about the First Step Act or things that is, are happening at the, the federal level, um, understand that that's a relatively small percentage of the, uh, the incarcerated population that those things touch, that um, if we want to make a real dent in mass incarceration, that means 50 individual states tackling this problem in, in the way that, um, uh, you know, we, we, every state has taken its own unique path to, to mass incarceration, has unique laws and has to unwind them in their own way but the states are really where the action is when it comes to mass incarceration. Um, what, why did this happen? What drove it? Um, well, it was policy, I would submit to you. It wasn't crime. It was, uh, you know, there, there was a period of time where crime was rising from the late 60s up through uh, the 90, early 90s, and then it start, started going down, and it's basically been going down since. But the things that really drove the uh, rising incarceration rate were decisions that were made to have a war on drugs, to uh, enact policies like truth in sentencing that uh, require people to spend more time in prison for the same crimes. Um, and so uh, those are the things that really got us where we are now. And those are the things that we're going to have to look at undoing uh, if we're going to get out of this predicament. Um, So this next slide kind of it, um, shows uh, crime rates and incarceration rates moving in the opposite direction, which is what's been happening um, in Illinois for, uh, for a while now. Um, uh, this slide comes from a study that uh, came out recently that um, uh, showed that in, um, Illinois uh, could uh, reduce its prison population by 25% more uh, without uh, any meaningful increase in crime because more incarceration does not, uh, contrary to our you know, policies that we've enacted over the last 40 or 50 years, uh, produce less crime. It's an ineffective crime, crime control uh, strategy as uh, these- um, um, Can I? These... No, see if I Sorry. Can... Was someone asking a question? Okay, I'll move on. Um, I think we just need so, to ask everybody to mute themselves. If everybody could mute themselves, please. 
Uh, thank you. So, um, you know, in, in addition to the population of people who are incarcerated rising, um, one of the consequences of these, um, the, these policies that have driven the rate uh, largely are policies that are um, related to sentence length, right? So we have you know, some policies and practices that result in more people being admitted to prison every year. Um, but then you know, we've had all these draconian penalty uh, enhancements and policies enacted in the legislature that make it uh, so that people spend more time in prison, a longer length of stay. And those crimes that have a longer length of stay tend to be uh, crimes involving violence or um, sometimes uh, weapons, which I wouldn't necessarily always categorize as a violent crime. But uh, for the purposes of this slide I have on the screen uh, is categorized that way. So as, as this, um, our population has gotten greater. We've also seen more people, um, a, a greater percentage of those who are incarcerated are, are in there spending long sentences for violent crimes. Um, so the, the, you know, what's been a longstanding myth that uh, the, the prisons are full of uh, non-violent drug offenders is is less true than it's ever been. If we want to look uh, really tackle this problem, we need to also reckon with the issue of violence and how long people are spending in prison for crimes that we all agree are are crimes are, are that need to uh, accountability. But um, but we need to to talk about what that looks like. Um, so. Uh, no uh, discussion of mass incarceration would be complete without uh, talking about the racial disparities. Um, in Illinois, our population is about 14.5% Black. Our prison population is about 54.8% Black. Um, so that comes out to, uh, uh, we incarcerate uh, Black folks at 8.8 times the rate that we incarcerate white people in this state. That's one of the uh, Worst disparities of any other any state, uh, number nine, uh, according to this um, set of statistics. Um, so, what have we been doing about it? Um, we've been, as I said, working in this area for a while. Um, when uh, Bruce Rauner was governor, he appointed a, a really strong commission of experts that met for two years, put out this great report that's still available online with twenty seven recommendations um, to reform sentences as and other practices. Um, terrific report. Um, the only problem, is, and, and I will say we uh, at that time took the lead in drafting legislation based on the contents of that report, the recommendations, this, and had it analyzed. Um, I'm just putting on the screen the um, sort of cover page of the, the analysis that showed that the number of people that fewer that would be in prison and the amount of money that would have saved the state had these things been enacted into law. Oh, only problem is very few of these things were enacted into law. Um, this chart um, that SPAC uh, helpfully created shows in green the things that um, the policies that were recommended by the commission that were enacted in yellow things that were done halfway or in part and in red things that didn't happen at all. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of yellow and red. And uh, in my own opinion, the things that are in red are the most important things. Um, some of the policies that I'll um, talk to you later about. And I apologize for the quality of this. If, so, if it would be helpful to share these actual documents that I am sharing shots of um, at some point, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I just was uh, really trying to make the broader point that most of these uh, recommendations that were made back in 2016 are still sitting on a shelf. They have not been uh, enacted into law or policy. So what, what needs to happen? Um, whether or not the, um, the state pursues the specific you know, reforms that the ACLU has, I think there are a few large sort of buckets or categories of reform that are just going to have to be part of any comprehensive approach to this problem. And they're, they're listed on the screen now. Reducing minimum sentences and getting rid of mandatory minimums that tie judges' hands and force them to send people to prison. 
when they could send uh, sentence them to probation or force them to uh, sentence people to prison for an unduly long period of time. Uh, reclassifying drug and property offenses. Most people uh, now agree that um, possession of drugs or a low level uh, crime like shoplifting isn't something that ought to se send somebody to prison. That's not the type of people that we need to be locking in a penitentiary. There are other interventions uh, to those problems uh, that are more effective, less costly and less damaging. Um, reducing the length of IDOC commitments. And that's both uh, time in prison as well as supervision um, after release. Um, as I said before, length of stay is really uh, a big driver, uh, even as much so or more than the number of people we're admitting into the system. The length of time is really a, a, an issue we need to talk about. Ending very short prison stays. Um, currently, we get we convict people of a low level felony. They've been sitting in county jail for a while. By the time they're sentenced, they have four months to serve or something. And there's no earthly purpose to physically transporting that person to the Department of Corrections, having them go through the battery of uh, um, of uh, being uh, received and classified and having a medical exam and having all their paperwork transferred uh, only to get no meaningful uh, programming and to get shipped right back to the county a few months later. That is uh, wasteful. And in the age of COVID, it just seems uh, especially crazy. So um, those are the, the buckets of reform. I think I'll breeze briefly through the, um, the specific reforms so we can get to questions. Um, but I do want to talk about specifics. What, because, because we have, uh, you know, drafted um, draft legislation that we've shared with legislators uh, um, around each of these proposals. And so I want you to know what some of them are. Uh, as far as reducing minimum sentences and mandatory minimums, uh, we would, uh, f felony crimes are, are all divided into felony classes, class four, class three, class two, one, and X, and then murder at the top. And for each of those, we have a minimum and a maximum sentencing range that the judge can choose from when the person's convicted. Um, and so the idea is if you make those minimums lower, um, most judges tend to sentence nearer to the minimum, and anecdotally, we hear from judges that they would sentence uh, that they would sentence people to probation that they're forced to sentence to prison now if they had the option. So, uh, by lowering the minimums, we could um, reduce the length of time that people are being sentenced to prison um, uh, in accordance with what judges would would do now if they have the opt if they had the option. Um, and, you know, uh, consistent with that, certain crimes that the, the law now says are mandatory prison crimes, that n probation is not an option, um, it should be an option. Um, two of those crimes are uh, residential burglary, which um, is, uh, as it sounds, is burglary of somebody's home. But the thing to understand about it is most of the time we're talking about an unoccupied home uh, as opposed to uh, the separate crime of home invasion, which is kind of like the violent intrusion uh, that immediately comes to mind when we talk about somebody burglarizing your home. Um, and then the other uh, crime we're talking about here is low level drug sales. So currently, if a person uh, delivers a uh, substance containing heroin in an amount greater than three grams, that means uh, they are going to prison definitely for four years. Um, four-year sentence, uh, probation is not an option, doesn't matter what their record is um, or, or any of the other facts of the case. And we're saying that uh, probation ought to be an option, uh, that um, particular mandatory minimum should be done away with. Um, gun enhancements. This is, um, I, I'm really interested in what this group thinks about that because I, I gun violence is an issue that um, I think concerns us all. Um, however, sometimes the responses, uh, the policy responses are ineffective, and um, I think this is one of those times. In around 2000, uh, th there was a law enacted that says a judge must, must add uh, 15, 20, or 25 years to the sentence, to the underlying sentence for crimes 
uh, when a gun is involved. And so if a person merely possesses a gun while they commit the crime, it's 15. If they uh, discharge the weapon, it's 20. And if they shoot someone, it's 25. Uh, mandatory um, sen sentence enhancement on top of the, uh, the uh, underlying sentence for the crime. So uh, those are not normal for uh, most states. Uh, a, a lot of states have firearm enhancements. No state, to my knowledge, has firearm enhancements that are this rigidly mandatory or this lengthy. Um, so a few years ago, the legislature voted to make these to give the judge discretion as to whether or not um, to apply these enhancements if the individual was young, if they were below the age of 21 uh, at the time they committed the crime. So at the very least, that should be extended to uh, uh, adults. But really, we need to look at either, if not eliminating these enhancements, really reducing dramatically the length of them and not making them mandatory, but making them discretionary. Um, we have some crimes called armed violence and um, uh, armed habitual criminal that basically um, uh, convert um, a low, low level crime into a higher level crime with a mandatory sentence it, based on the pro some prior convictions that people have. Um, we think that uh, that should be repealed. Um, Three strikes laws are another example of that, where we have um, we look at somebody's past record and they um, get a dramatically enhanced uh, sentencing range for uh, for something that they're now being charged with. Um, so, and some of those three strikes laws uh, send people to prison for life without parole. Um, and so, if if the uh, state of Illinois is going to continue to uh, sentence people to die in prison. Uh, we don't think they should, but if they're going to do that, it shouldn't be because of a drug offense or because of any certainly nonviolent crime. It should really be because of crimes involving grievous harm to another human being. And so we have proposals to narrow down these three strikes laws, if they're not going to be repealed, to narrow them down to apply only to those most serious of crimes. Um, Extended term sentences are a thing that allow um, that that convert already um, you know broad and, uh, sentencing ranges with severe maximums into just draconian sentences if certain aggravating factors are found to apply. Um, we think that twenty to sixty years is plenty of. Um, a 60 year maximum for first degree murder is uh, going to mean mo for most people that they spend the rest of their life in prison. Uh, there's no reason to have 60 to 100 years. Um, and then down at the class four felony level where we're talking about drug possession and shoplifting, why do we have extended term sentences? What could possibly uh, justify that? Um, so we uh, would suggest that they should be done away with. Um, all drug crimes are uh, over penalized now uh, from, from simple possession up to trafficking. Um, you know, we have crime, we have drug crimes that carry sentences of 60 year maximums. Uh, and, um, you know, for three strikes law can send you to prison for life. So uh, from top to bottom, uh, the drug sentences need to be reduced uh, by at least one class. And um, most importantly, at the low level, um, and some of you may have heard me give a presentation about this specific topic before, but in Illinois, possession of any amount of any uh, illegal substance is a felony. Uh, and that's not the case in every state. There's about 20 states, the federal law, um, where we have misdemeanor drug possession, which is um, a far less severe lifelong stigma. And of course, you can't go to the state penitentiary for a misdemeanor. So we really need to move toward uh, decriminalization of drugs. But um, the first step, I think, is we need to defelonize um, simple possession in small amounts, make that a misdemeanor, and start um, getting people who need treatment into treatment instead of trying to punish our way out of a addiction and overdose crisis. And then on property crimes, we have one of the lowest felony thresholds 
uh, for shoplifting of any state in the country. Only two states have lower uh, dollar amount for um, because th that's how we determine it is the, the uh, um, value of the stolen property. And uh, in Illinois, it's $300. Um, anything above that, uh, it's a felony. Um, so we need to raise that uh, to be more in the mainstream of states. Uh, our proposal is to raise it to $2,000. We also need to get rid of the law that says if a person's previously been convicted of any kind of theft and now they, they're caught shoplifting, it's a felony, even if it's a, a sandwich or a, a, you know, a CD or some low value item, um, even, even uh, thefts below that $300 threshold can be felonies uh, under those circumstances, so that needs to go away. Truth in sentencing laws, very important. Um, in 1998, Illinois passed truth in sentencing. That's, um, so but before then, um, virtually everybody who went to the Department of Corrections um, if uh, earned a day off their sentence or uh, the time that they would spend incarcerated for every day of their sentence that they served without a disciplinary incident. Um, so that, that time was just awarded to them. It could be taken away uh, if they... Uh, misbehave, but that was basically the, the way it worked for everyone. Truth in sentencing said for people convicted of more serious crimes, you're either going to uh, earn no good time whatsoever. So in the case of first degree murder, now you went from spending 50% of the time to spending 100% of the time. Uh, uh, and then for other serious crimes uh, to require them to spend 85% of the sentence, uh, limiting the good time they could earn uh, to 15%. And then later on, they passed a, a third tier, 75% for drug trafficking and um, things like that. Um, so we would um, suggest that if those things aren't going to be repealed, that they need to be rolled back, that people who are convicted of murder need to be enabled to uh, earn at least some good time, uh, given an incentive to participate in programs, to um, to not engage in violence or other forms of misbehavior while they're incarcerated. Um, and, uh, and good time is a way to do that. Um, it's also a way to reduce the population, which we need to do. These people, a lot of these people will long, have long ago aged out of crime. They're not their release would not pose a public safety threat. Um, people are currently serving excessive sentences. So um, rolling back truth in sentencing is a way to attack that problem. We also need to deal with the recidivism rate where, where people are cycling back into prison on uh, technical violations while they're being supervised uh, after their release. Uh, we think part of the problem is they're being supervised in the wrong way and for too long. And um, uh, we can, you know, I think we need to change the culture around the way we supervise people who, um, after they're released, to, to support them and, and meet their needs for housing and jobs and the, the types of things that help people uh, stay out of the system. But we also need, you know, the current model is a surveillance and enforcement model. And so we need to just reduce that period of time so that we're not sending people back into prison for, uh, you know, uh, not passing a drug test or failing to check in with a parole officer or violating an electric electronic monitor or, uh, you know, any of the array of other conditions that uh, people have to um, uh, fulfill while they're on mandatory supervised release. So the uh, proposal is to reduce those terms that are set by statute currently. Um, make them shorter, and for the lower level crimes, get rid of it entirely unless the prisoner review board uh, specifically finds that for that individual, you know, based on a validated risk uh, and needs assessment tool, this person needs uh, some supervision and here's what they need. Um, but um, barring that for a, a low level crime, when you're released, you should be free. Um, I talked earlier about ending short prison stays uh, of like a few months that just don't, it doesn't do anybody any good. It's wasteful. And um, so I don't need to, I don't think talk more about that. The final thing I will say something about is retroactivity. Um, so all of these reforms, unless the um, uh, legislature specifically provides otherwise, 
will not pr uh, apply to the more than 30,000 people that are um, currently incarcerated under policies that I'm submitting to you are unjust policies that need to be reformed. So um, there needs to be specific action taken uh, to make sure that those folks aren't left behind, that we, you know, as we admit a mistake going forward, we we don't let people rot and die in prison uh, based on unjust policies. So the legislature really needs to um, make these reforms retroactive or create other mechanisms like, uh, the, like a parole system to enable people who are serving very long sentences uh, a second chance and another a second look to, to see if they can safely be released because many, many of them could be. Um, so that is my presentation on sentencing. Um, I could either um, take questions now on that, or I could say a few words about uh, bail and uh, and then take questions uh, depending on what you prefer. Why don't we go ahead and take some questions about sentencing? Um, I have one that I wanted to ask, which is, um, would you explain about felony murder and the sentencing guidelines for that? Um, sure. So felony murder is a, a doctrine, a legal doctrine that basically um, holds a person accountable for a murder that was committed by another individual, but um, that involved a, um, a crime that this um, person was, was involved with. So I'm the, like, uh, let's say I'm the getaway driver in a, robbing a liquor store and the person I'm uh, uh, who, who goes in, ends up shooting the, the clerk and, uh, and they die. I could be um, held, uh, I could be found guilty of murder as if I were the one who fired the gun under felony murder uh, doctrine. And Illinois um, has a pretty broad and expansive um, version of that doctrine. And there are some proposals out there which we are supportive of um, to, to narrow that, to make sure that if somebody's going to be held responsible for murder, that they were, you know, sufficiently close to that um, uh, um, that crime, that it wasn't, um, you know, that that it, 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 it that we're not doing an injustice by uh, um, holding somebody accountable for murder who was really just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, uh, I saw a question in the chat about what um, reasons do opponents of sentencing reform give? Um, I think there, there are a variety of reasons, um, depending on which reforms you're talking about. Um, for instance, like uh, on the lower level, when we talk about drug possession, uh, there are uh, some of the opponents will say, well, you know, uh, I understand that people have a problem and they need to get help, but you know, we, we have all these diversion programs and, you know, we're not sending people to prison on the first or second try, you know, it's a, and some, at some point people need to learn. And, um, you know, I think they're like, I, I want to just beat my head against the wall when I hear that, because um, the fact that uh, it's not working the first or second time uh, should give you a pretty good indication it's not going to work the third or the fourth. And, you know, we can't be treating complex health addictions like, uh, addiction with punishment. But um, at the higher end, it's, you know, some people did something terrible. They need to be punished. They need to be held accountable. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it, it's, it's true. You know, if somebody uh, takes another person's life, that's, I think we all agree there needs to be a serious consequence for that, but it's a matter of proportionality. And it's also a matter of our, you know, our state constitution's directive that we're, we're supposed to consider the seriousness of the offense. We're also consider, supposed to consider uh, returning the um, individual to useful citizenship when we, we craft penalties. And, and that's the balance we need to strike. And currently it's super out of balance. So um, I think there are a, a number of other arguments that you know, are, are proffered by the opponents of sentencing reform, but I, for the, uh, in the interest of getting to other questions, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, overuse of solitary confinement. Yeah, um, I think any use of solitary confinement is really, um, uh, kind of a travesty, you know, it's um, 
and when we talk about solitary confinement, people have different um, definitions, but I think what the way we would define it is where people are held in a cell without any time outside the cell for 23, 24 hours a day. Um, and um, we know there's plenty of research that shows that that, that breaks down individuals' mental health. People who didn't have mental illnesses going into the system sometimes develop mental illnesses because they're subjected to this inhumane treatment and um, start engaging in self-harm and all, you know, um, throwing bodily fluids and all kinds of uh, behavior that is a direct result of the, um, the inhumane treatment that we're, um, we're forcing on them. So it's, a, it's really a human rights um, disaster, the, the, the way that um, solitary confinement is used in this country and in this state. And um, in, sometimes it's used because of, um, you know, lack of resources. Um, people are we're sort of warehousing people, but it's also just it, within our um, over punitive system, we over penalize uh, disciplinary infractions and sentence people to terms of solitary confinement for things they do inside. So that needs to really be uh, looked at. Um, I'm looking at in the chat, um, why did many of the recommendations in Rauner's uh, commission not get enacted? In part, I think some of the blame lies at the uh, feet of the governor himself, not really supporting the uh, recommendations of his own commission, not being willing to expend a lot of political capital um, to do the heavy lifts. Um, there, were, there was some progress in the Rauner years. There were some uh, bills that passed. I think the complaint is that there were a lot of small reforms in a lot of spread out over a lot of different bills, which left a lot of legislators feeling that they took hard votes on criminal justice reform and they had criminal justice fatigue when in reality they haven't done all that much at all. Um, and what would have been better is sort of the omnibus approach to what, that we've been suggesting. Put everything in Senate Bill 1971 or a similar package let everybody take one vote um, that, you know, um, you know, the, the reason people have fatigue or they're nervous about these things is there's a long history of legislators or candidates attacking one another as being soft on crime or, you know, letting uh, murderers and rapists out on the streets or whatever. So people are uh, fearful of that dynamic. Um, and uh, nobody wants to take the plunge unless they all take it together. So that's what they should do, put it all in one bill and take, uh, take the vote. Um, another broad question, have any states successfully enacted any of the su suggested mandatory reforms? What strategy did they use to successfully pass these reforms? Um, yeah, there have been uh, more progress in other states than there have been in Illinois. Um, and in a, a lot of the strategy has involved, you know, bipartisanship and bringing, um, not letting it be a partisan issue. And, you know, a, a lot of the states that have led the way have been red states and they have led the way in part because they've had some of the most severe over incarceration problems that were dire that, that needed immediate action. So states like Oklahoma that had Republican governors um, that had even higher incarceration rates than Illinois at its worst, um, you know, have done some of the things that we're still trying to do as far as on like drug possession and uh, retail theft, raising the threshold. Um, states like Mississippi have done more than we've done as far as rolling back truth and sentencing because they had no choice. Their prisons were, um, were even more overcrowded than ours were. So, um, uh, in part, the strategy was bipartisanship. In part, it was, and, and we really missed our moment on that. I have to say, uh, when Rauner was governor, you know, that was the window when when um, all of this could have gotten done. But we're, you know, we're not looking back. We're looking forward. Um, so um, I think, though, you know, the, the history is that in order in, in Illinois, in order to get significant things done, especially on criminal justice. Um, 
you need at least some Republicans to, to be part of it. So um, I think that's going to be um, a key question, who, who those people are going to be uh, that are going to uh, going to lead on that side of the aisle. But um, um, yeah, that, uh, so um, yeah, let me just move on to the next question because I see there are a few um, of the recommendations which have, have a chance of being passed in the new legislature. Um, I hope that a lot of them, you know, I think that the ones that we've uh, really emphasized a lot are on truth and sentencing and on drug sentences. Um, three strikes, um, some of the mandatory minimums that I mentioned, like uh, residential burglary and low level drug sales. Those are things that came straight out of the Rauner Commission report. And so I think, you know, they have the imprimatur of a bipartisan uh, panel of criminal justice experts. Um, so those, I think, you know, I, I think the things that we need to do are not limited to what that commission recommended, but the fact that those, there's a kind of a long history there and some, um, some validation uh, from a bipartisan perspective makes it makes those things maybe more likely. Um, how do private prisons factor in Illinois incarceration? Um, well, they don't um, actually, because Illinois doesn't have private prisons. We have a ban on private prisons. But we do like privatization of like, uh, it, it's still, you know, profit motive and private companies do loom large in our criminal legal system. And, and you know, and even in our prisons, you know, for instance, the all the medical services are provided by a con a third party uh, private contractor called Wexford and um, some of you might know that um, the ACLU has is it in a consent decree with the Department of Corrections. Uh, with regard to the inadequate medical care that they're currently providing to incarcerated people. So uh, I would be lying if I said privatization doesn't play a role. It also plays a role with regard to reentry because all of these services um, and, and pretrial also, services like drug testing and electronic monitoring um, are provided by private contractors. And so, you know, when these things are uh, promoted as alternatives to incarceration, we need to ask ourselves who's profiting and are we, is it really a, an alternative to incarceration or is it a, a, a incarceration by another name uh, that's, um, you know, uh, building up a prison industrial complex? Um, what does cost benefit analysis of reforms show compared with the cost of current sentencing policies and practices? Um, well, it shows that we could um, we could reduce our population a lot and um, have le less um, severe sentences in terms of the length of time that people spend incarcerated and get, you know, no different result with regard to public safety, which means, you know, if we did it on a broad enough scale and the recent um, report from the Guggenheim Foundation found that we could do it um, we could reduce our population from its current point an additional 25% without meaningfully moving the needle on crime rates up or down, because that's sim simply not what causes crime. Um, uh, so um, from a cost benefit standpoint, there's a, a lot of room to move uh, downward as far as the um, overall level of incarceration and the individual length of time that that individuals are, are serving incarcerated or, um, you know, or, or might not need to be incarcerated at all um, without, um, you know, if public safety is the, the goal, um, I guess, um, going back to the earlier question about what opponents say, not everybody agrees that public safety is the most important or the only goal. So some people think it's uh, punishment is really important, that society needs to send a message, and that's really important. And so a person like that, I don't know what to tell them, but if if public safety is what, you know, you care about, and I'm telling you, I think it's what you should care about more than, than punishment, because we got plenty of that now. We got an excess of that, um, that, that we can have a lot less um, punishment and um, 
and actually do better public safety wise, because if we're not um, dumping all these resources into failed approaches uh, and incarceration is very costly, um, then we should, uh, in theory, you know, um, have more money to spend on the, the front end types of investments we can make in communities to act actually move the needle on the things that, that do uh, uh, impact crime. And um, so I, I know from a budgetary standpoint, it's not as simple as that, like things are siloed. Um, saving money over here doesn't mean it's going to go to the right place. So it needs to be done in a thoughtful way, but that's, um, that's the way we need to do it. Um, what is the proportion of private prisons? Uh, as I said, we don't have any in Illinois. There have them in other states, but I can't really speak to, to that question um, as far as the, what the proportion is. How do you explain the extreme racial disparity in the prison population? Will sentencing reform address that imbalance? Um, you know, that's a great question because sentencing reform can only address it to a certain degree. We know that, um, you know, um, a lot of the, the bias and the, the racial disparity is produced through over policing um, and who goes in on the front end. So, um, uh, but we also, um, so, so the, you know, the, the answer is sentencing reform alone will not eliminate racial disparity in the system. Um, it will um, reduce the um, deleterious impact of racially disparate, you know, policies that, um, you know, whether the, um, the race, the, the bias happens at the policing level, at the um, charging level or the sentencing level. I think it exists at all of those places, but um, I think it, it's a good point that sentencing reform is not the be all end all when it comes to that, um, that um, policing is possibly the most uh, relevant place to, to look to reform if we really wanna root out the racial bias in the system. Um, is this considered a bipartisan issue in, with bipartisan support? Well, as I said, the um, not so many years ago, a bipartisan commission uh, endorsed and recommended a lot of these reforms. Um, some of those people are still around, some of them are not. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that there are, um, there is room for a bipartisan consent. It, and as long as we don't allow criminal justice to devolve into being a partisan issue. That's the thing I worry about is that um, it becomes um, that, that people become more interested in sort of the expediency of using uh, crime as a cudgel to attack their political opponents um, versus a, uh, a serious um, policy area that they want to um, engage with. Um, and that, that I, I should hasten to add that that happens on both sides and Democrats are in Illinois are every bit as guilty of doing that as Republicans. So I, do, I don't want uh, anyone to think that I'm suggesting that it's only Republicans that uh, engage in those kinds of attacks. Um, is there currently movement on reform in the legislature? I think so, I hope so. Um, some of you may be aware that the Il uh, Illinois Legislative Black Caucus has um, talked about a four, a very ambitious four pillar uh, reform agenda. One of the four pillars is criminal justice reform, policing reform and violence reduction. Uh, and um, there have been a series of hearings uh, about um, some of those topics and, and some of the very same topics that I've been talking to you about this evening. Um, and, you know, the, as being in the mix, as far as like a package that the Black Caucus would seek to move um, in this moment where there really does seem to be greater re receptivity than ever to sort of systemic reform and to, to legislators taking seriously the things that advocates have been talking to them for years now about the need to reform systems and not to nibble around the edges, but to really um, uh, move, uh, uh, meaningful, uh, impactful reforms that are going to um, uh, uh, really have an impact. Um, but uh, it, it, part of the, when we're determining is there movement, you know, we're still trying to assess 
I, I'm out there having conversations with legislators to try and figure out, you know, what of all of these long list of things has the support to actually pass. And, um, and then when are they going to meet again uh, is not clear because uh, the pandemic has thrown the legislative session into uh, um, a lot of um, disarray. We didn't have the, the fall veto session. Uh, the General Assembly has talked about meeting for a, um, a lame duck session in January um, before the new members that were the newly elected members are sworn in um, to, to, to have a, a special session before that. But uh, under the current pandemic conditions, it's not clear what that would look like or whether it's feasible to expect that they would undertake a bold reform agenda under those conditions. In which case, like advocates, you know, really would not be able to be physically present. And um, so the normal lobbying that we do, we, we can't do. Um, but um, but yeah, we're hopeful that when they get back, when the legislature gets back to work, that this um, uh, uh, Black Caucus agenda could be the vehicle for moving some really impactful reform. Because let's face it, all of this stuff is a racial justice issue. It's all impacting black and brown communities um, disproportionately and not just by a little, but by a lot. So um, I think the criminal legal system uh, the, uh, it impacts us all, certainly the, um, but, um, but communities of color are impacted most of all. So as long as racial uh, justice remains front and center on the agenda, then I'm optimistic that we'll see some reform in this area, because uh, this is one of the worst areas of racial injustice. Um, additional and more comprehensive mental health services being added to reform recommendations. You know, I'm really uh, very um, open to, uh, I'm, I'm the first to admit I'm not a mental health expert, um, and, uh, but, but I, you know, I, I, the question is super important because we need to reinvest in the systems that are like currently we're using the, the criminal legal system as a dumping ground for people who ought to be getting services for, for mental health or for substance use disorder, or, you know, who are just downright poor and who need investment in their communities and need opportunity. And so, um, there need to be reinvestment in a lot of those things. And we, we've made some efforts, for instance, on the drug side, um, as we've worked with uh, Representative Ammons from uh, Champaign-Urbana to write legislation to make low-level drug possession a misdemeanor, we thought it was important to, to show that, like, look, you know, we understand that lowering the penalty isn't the entire picture that there's a problem that needs to be addressed. We're just addressing it in the wrong way. So making a part of that bill, like a misdemeanor diversion program, allow people to get an, an off ramp, people who have been arrested for drug possession to get assessed uh, for the services that they might need and, and diverted in, into those services and out of the criminal legal system, you know, like the, um, the approach too often when it comes to mental health or substance use disorder in the criminal legal system is we want to, um, when, when we say diversion, we mean um, diversion under the supervision of a prosecutor or a judge. And if we don't like the way that you um, experience the, the services we send you to, or um, then we, we will, um, supervise you longer and send you to prison and you know the tentacles of the system will pull you in further we need to get out of that model and get into a model where we build up the mental health systems in the, the community-based mental health and and substance use treatment systems and other systems that are currently lacking that got hollowed out during the rounder years and now that are you know being jeopardized again um in, in the sort of looming state budget crisis. Um, we need to find a way to make invest to, you know, stop wasting money on failed systems on the criminal legal side and making smart investments 
um, in communities for mental health and for other things. So, um, and I think those two things can be linked. Um, I think, um, and, and I've tried to do that to the extent that I'm able to not being a mental health expert, but, but understanding that um, uh, the, the full picture is not just fewer pen, like um, reducing penalties, but um, building up the systems that we've let, um, you know, the, the, the safety net that has gotten frayed that were, or, or never built up adequately in the first place that we've asked asked police and prosecutors and judges to solve problems they were never meant to or trained to or qualified to solve like addiction and mental illness. Um, I have and, one more question, uh, Ben, before we move on to pretrial. Uh, I, actually, this bridges the two. Uh, when is, do you think it's appropriate uh, to use electronic monitoring, either pretrial or after discharge from the penal system? Um, that's a great question because I don't think it's ever been demonstrated that it's what the value is or whether it has value. It's been, it's one of those things that's been um, promoted as an alternative to incarceration. And, um, you know, many of us have for probably too long accepted it as like, well, yeah, that's worse than being in prison. That's worse than being, or excuse me, that's better than being in prison or being in jail. Um, when we hear the actual experience of people who have been put on electronic monitoring, um, that's not always what we hear from them. Sometimes we hear like, you know, I wish they would have kept me in prison rather than um, what I had to endure being on house arrest and, you know, trying to get movement to go out to job interviews and, and this and that. So, um, you know, there is no real evidence base around the use of electronic monitoring. I think it's possible that there are instances in which it's useful. I would certainly rather see people in their communities, in their homes than in prisons. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we can't just accept, we can't just say, oh yeah, well, it's better than prison. So sure, put everybody on a monitor. Um, uh, that, that, that needs to stop. And pretrial, um, same thing, you know, we've, um, even as we've, you know, made some progress reducing the, the jail population in Cook County, we've seen the people on pretrial electronic monitoring balloon and there's no clear indication that that's um, making anybody safer. We know that some people are making money off that um, and, that, and that some people are having their lives disrupted in a really um, disruptive way and their whole families. But um, when is it effective? I don't know. I think the people who want to use it, who think it's, uh, you know, um, who think we need more of that that the onus uh, should be on them to, to show the evidence that it, it works, that it does some public safety good and, and what that is and um, how to um, properly tailor the use. Uh, but right now that, that evidence is lacking. And of course, that's not the way it works. The onus is not on them. The onus is on advocates to demand that evidence and to you know um, demand that um, some rollbacks in the use of this practice, or at least some guardrails around it, so it doesn't just, um, you know, as uh, we end up with, um, as we reduce the prison population, we end up with 30,000 people in the community with ankle monitors. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, that's, and, and I, I think there are a lot of people like um, uh, James Kilgore's e Ecarceration Project in uh, Champaign Urbana and uh, the Shriver Center um, have uh, more information that they can share about the issue of electronic monitoring uh, if people are interested in that. But um, uh, yeah, I think it's um, it, it's a thing that is getting some much needed uh, sunlight shown on it, um, finally. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, great questions and, and very informative answers, but let's move on now and talk about the bond system. Sure. So, um, so the ACLU is a member of the um, something called the Coalition to End Money Bond, 
and then the Associated uh, Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice. And we've been working for several years um, to reform practices, um, pretrial practices in the um, in Cook County and in and statewide around the use of money bond specifically and uh, and the use of pretrial incarceration generally. So we know that um, every year about 250,000 people uh, move through Illinois jails and that most of those people are um, not convicted of a crime but awaiting trial on a crime. So they are um, uh, innocent until proven guilty but incarcerated. And of that group who are incarcerated pre-trial, um, the majority are incarcerated on a, on a money bond. So um, there are, you know, a, a, there are a few different things that can happen. So when a person gets arrested, typically they go before a bond court judge fairly soon after being arrested, and the judge has to make a decision as to uh, what to do with that individual. And you know, one first option is they're given a court date um, and released on their own recognizance or with some conditions that they have to fulfill. Um, you know, don't go here or there, don't do this or that, but you're, um, you're not in jail. Um, and then the second uh, outcome is no bond. Um, this individual is so dangerous uh, to the community if they were released or so likely to flee the jurisdiction if released that we, the court finds that they really need to be locked up in jail. Um, this third category is what is we seek to address um, in uh, our uh, what's called the Pretrial Fairness Act, the legislation that's been put forth by our, our coalition, is people who are incarcerated, um, who the judge have sa has said, yes, it's safe to release you, but only if you come up with a certain sum of cash um, and post that as um, in order to get out. Um, and so the, there are uh, the the majority of the people who are incarcerated pre-trial in Illinois are not incarcerated because the judge said they're too dangerous to release or too likely to flee. It's because the court set a bond that's too high for that person to pay it. They don't have the money. And that is no way of doing justice. That is not justice, is to, to make access to wealth determinative of somebody's freedom while they're awaiting trial on uh, uh, criminal charges. I mean, for a number of reasons. We know, you know, pr uh, being jailed even for a few days is a major disruption to people's lives that causes them to lose jobs, lose their housing, um, lose children in some cases. Um, the, um, the disruption that happens isn't just to that person, but to their families, to all the people who love them. And we know that the people who end up paying money bonds often aren't the individuals who are incarcerated. They're their, um, their moms, their girlfriends, their grandmothers, they're off, very often women in their lives, but their, their loved ones are the ones that are footing the bill to get their, their, um, their loved one out of jail. Um, of course, if somebody has access to wealth, then it doesn't matter how dangerous it is to release them. They can just pay the bond and they're out. Um, so, you know, aside from the fact that money bond is just unjust, um, full stop, it's just unjust. We've all come to accept it because it's, it's, you know, we watch movies and TV shows about crime. That's, it's just part of the fabric. Like that's how you get out of jail. You pay the bail. Um, but um, we don't ask ourselves, and I didn't, you know, to be perfectly honest, ask myself until relatively recently, a few years ago, why is that? Why do we do things that way? No other country in the world, except I think the Philippines uses cash bond. The juvenile system doesn't use cash bond. The federal system uses it very little. Um, Washington DC hasn't used it in decades. New Jersey eliminated it a few years ago. Uh, what are we waiting for? So, um, so eliminating cash bond is important and it's central to what needs to happen. 
but it's not the only thing, right? In the same way that um, reducing penalties um, isn't the only um, thing that needs to happen uh, on the sentencing side, um, you know, as far as our public safety approach, we need a better, fairer, more consistent set of rules that apply statewide for how these pretrial hearings happen, how these decisions are made about who's in jail or who's out of jail. Um, based on these principles of like, is somebody, um, is there clear and convincing evidence that the individual, um, that their release would pose a risk to another person or people, or is there evidence that they're likely to flee the jurisdiction and not forget to come to court, but actually, you know, willfully flee the jurisdiction. Which and those two things often get conflated when we talk about um, uh, pretrial reform. Is you know the issue of failure to appear is treated like the same thing as if people uh, willfully fled the jurisdiction. But we know that um, if we want people to come to court, um, you know, money bond isn't the best way of doing that. It's actually more effective to provide people things like court reminders, uh, transportation to court. Um, those are some of the barriers that actually lead to failure to appear more than um, you know, uh, people trying to skip out on cases. You know, A lot of the people who get caught up in the criminal legal system in Illinois live their lives in the span, uh, in the you know, very com compressed geographic areas. They're not hard to find. Um, so um, that w if we want them to come to court, I think we can, um, we can do a better job than we're doing. We don't need money bond to do it. Um, so the, what the Pretrial Fairness Act is, is it really takes kind of a holistic approach to um, getting right um, what the detention hearing looks like, who's eligible even to be detained. Like if you've been arrested for possessing drugs and that's it, well, jail shouldn't really be an option. Um, so making sure that the net of offenses for which a person even uh, could be detained pretrial is, um, is appropriately tailored. And then having a system where the prosecutor uh, needs to pick and choose who they really think is, uh, needs to be uh, detained based on the fact that they are um, a, a danger to the public or a flight risk, and then have a real hearing, not the sham uh, 30 second to two minute, what passes for a detention hearing now, if you've ever seen bond court in Cook County, and the, you know, um, it's a cattle call, it's just shameful that people's um, uh, freedom or lack thereof is made under those circumstances in that time frame. So Part of it is slowing down and bringing to bear some actual evidence on like, why is it that we're considering uh, jailing this individual while they await their day in court? Um, and then, and, and doing that in the cases where it's important and then um, not doing it in all the rest. Um, um, so um, so the, the Pretrial Fairness Act would really revamp the whole system of, of detention hearings, make clear, um, clear statewide rules to um, replace what is currently a kind of jumbled, uh, contra self-contradictory mass of laws that have been cobbled together over a period of decades and practices that are, you know, wildly uh, inconsistent from one place in the state to another. So you might have um, in one place, somebody charged with a particular thing is released on their own recognizance. Somewhere else they're released on a $500 money bond. Somewhere else they're released on a $5,000 money bond and somewhere else they're held no bond. We wanna make the, the guidelines more consistent, but have a more robust real decision um, happen um, in the court, have, have the judge make a real decision as opposed to slap a dollar figure on somebody's freedom with really uh, limited knowledge of that individual or um, their access to wealth or, or, uh, or anything else. So another component of the Pretrial Fairness Act is data collection around um, how 
pretrial incarceration is used um, and where it's used and um, um, if pretrial uh, risk assessment tools are being used to, to, um, to guide these decisions, what are those tools and, and how are they being used um, to, um, as some of you might know, the, the courts are kind of a black hole of, of information. The, unlike most other states, our court system is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. So if you don't have these um, data collection requirements built into the law, we might never know, and we might not know if the, you know, there are unintended consequences to this law, you know, which is one thing people worry about. If, you know, if it's an in or out system, as opposed to a money bond system where somebody can buy their way out eventually or, or have their way, um, somebody else post the bond for them, is there a risk that the that things could go in the wrong direction? I mean, I, I, one of the underlying principles of our coalition is that too many people are incarcerated uh, pre-trial um, now. So it would be a, a real shame if as a result of some reform, there was an unintended consequence that um, more judges uh, were dramatically um, uh, increasing the use of no bonds um, and holding more people that way. So data collection is just crucial to know is this reform having the intended impact um, and, uh, um, so that, that's part of the law too, um, or, or the bill, I should say, what we hope will be a, a new law. Ben, did you want to put your, uh, pretrial fairness flyer up or would you like me to, I will get sent you know, out to everyone. You know, wh why don't we just, um, distribute that to folks? Um, I can, um, you know, it, it's really, it's just kind of a one pager that um, uh, it summarizes a lot of what I've shared already. But I think that the thing that um, is useful, uh, is most useful is it tells you where to get more information, which is from Sharon Mitchell at the Illinois Justice Project, um, who is kind of like leading the lobbying charge on this and, and is one of our state's foremost um, experts and one of our coalition partners in the in the coalition to end money bonds. So, um, Sharon, uh, if you ever want a an in depth presentation about this topic, um, don't invite me. Invite Sharon or invite Charlene Grace from the Chicago Community Bond Fund. They are the um, the experts, or or Sarah Stapp from Chicago Appleseed. Um, but um, we are very um, we're a partner in this work and very supportive of it, and we hope to um, to uh, do what we can to see that the Pretrial Fairness Act is passed into law. I have that flyer and I can make it available uh, to our members. I, I have a couple of questions about the, the pretrial process that maybe you can answer, Ben. One is, are at these bond hearings, are all the uh, people represented by a lawyer and the second is um, about the public risk assessment. How widely is that used? Do all judges use it? Um, I think um, I think um, starting from. So I'm sorry. Your your first question again, because I forgot. Was, it, was about whether uh, everybody is represented by a lawyer, a defense lawyer, at these hearings. Well, everybody is supposed to have that opportunity because of the uh, Bail Reform Act of 2017. Um, so um, it, it says that a person is entitled to a public defender at the bond hearing. Believe it or not, that was not the case uh, before that. And even in Cook County, um, they had only that was the practice already when they passed that law, but it, it had only been the practice for a few years. So um, it, yes, um, the law says that a person is entitled to that. Um, whether that is being adhered to in all cases, I couldn't attest. I know um, it's been an issue in the past and I think continues to be an issue, access to public defenders in downstate counties, especially in rural counties, many of which do not even have their own uh, appointed public defender, but you have like somebody who's a local attorney 
who's appointed to serve as the public defender sometimes for multiple counties and is driving, shuttling around to different court systems. And so there could be issues with access to public defenders just based on like in those downstate counties. And um, we've heard of people doing, um, you know, coming up with fixes like having the, the public defender on the phone or, or something like that. So I'm not sure how those, I, I, certainly when that law was passed, some of the downstate counties were complaining that it would be, you know, difficult or costly for them to comply. Um, I'm not sure how that's um, playing out to tell the truth, to tell you the truth, but um, the law entitles somebody to representation and as it should. And, you know, if people aren't getting that representation, then I think we need to allocate more public resources to, you know, have more public defenders available so that people are not um, without that representation. Um, and then, um, and your second question, because now I've what, forgotten that. Was, was about the use of the uh, uh, public or the risk assessment and how widely is that used or is it, do you know if it's valid and reliable or how do you feel about it? Um, so um, they are used, at, there's a risk assessment that's used in Cook County that's been used for several years. And I believe that they're in use in some other places. I'm sure that they're not in use everywhere. Um, and um, I think, you know, there has been, uh, it, it, it seems like that's the direction things are headed is, is um, more universal use of a risk assessment tool. And the, um, if that happens, um, we hope the, uh, the more consistency in what kind of a tool, uh, um, you know, you asked our opinion, my opinion about like, it, are they valid? Are they reliable? The ground has shifted a lot um, in a short time around risk assessments as far as um, how we in the advocacy community feel about them. I think, you know, um, in, in large part, we, you know, a few years ago sort of welcomed um, seeing uh, some of these algorithmic tools come into the the system or were, were more welcoming because they gave um, they gave system actors um, justification and mechanisms to um, to de do de incarcerative things. Um, and that I think that remains true, but um, the tools themselves have come under a lot greater scrutiny. And I think a lot of people have asked the very valid question of uh, because if you look at the, um, the the data that what what goes into an algorithmic risk assessment tool, it's basically what what's being looked at in addition to just the somebody's you know age and sex is like their um, um, their criminal history. Have they been arrested before? Have they been convicted of before? And we know that those things don't touch everyone equally that they, because of the racial bias on the front end, because of over-policing, people of color are going to, on average, have more in the way of criminal history that's going to denote risk under one of these tools than white people. And the, is there any way in, a, in a, using a tool that's founded largely based on criminal history data to disentangle it from race, the racial bias that is so interwoven in, you know, the systems that give people a criminal history in the first place. And I think, you know, the answer is, is no. And so a lot of the advocates have sort of become either um, flipped one, 360 degrees and said, um, you shouldn't use risk assessment tools at all. These tools are, are bad. Um, or um, you need to place some guardrails at the very minimum around them. And that's kind of, I think that's what the Pretrial Fairness Act attempts to do, because I think, you know, there are these concerns around these tools are real and um, our coalition um, shares them. Uh, we're no, you know, we're, we're not, telling everybody that they ought to like do more, use more risk assessment tools, that that's a great thing. 
um, even though there have been some studies that show that like racist though they may be they're less racist than judges um, oh, no. decisions without the use of a risk assessment tool um, so you know I think that there's still uh, valid questions about how um, uh, their, their use and what's their proper place in in system in different parts of the criminal legal system. But I think at the very minimum, we need to constantly scrutinize these tools and what goes into them, make sure we don't have a garbage in garbage out situation and be constantly trying to refine them and uh, better them and extricate racial bias to the you know maximum possible degree um, if we're gonna use tools like that. Good point. Okay. I, there's one more question in chat that I think we haven't addressed. Uh, are judges' opinions sought in developing and advocating for reforms? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, that that commission that I um, have spoken about several times that was um, uh, uh, constituted under Governor Rauner uh, included a number of retired judges um, there, the recent hearings that have been held in the General Assembly, um, uh, you know, virtual hearings um, because of the, the pandemic, but there have been a number of hearings that have included testimony from retired judges. Um, we have, um, I shared as part of my presentation, some, some documents from SPAC, the Sentencing Policy Advisory Council, uh, which um, includes a broad array of criminal justice um, stakeholders and system actors, but including judges and retired judges. So yeah, judges are part of the, um, the conversation as they should be. Any other questions? Well, I guess maybe we've answered them all and it's getting close to uh, 830. So uh, we want to Thank you very much for all the information you've shared with us. It's going to help in our consensus work. Uh, any final comments? I just want to thank you all so very much for having me and listening to you know me talk about these topics. Um, the uh, PowerPoint slides that you should all have a copy of that uh, uh, have my contact information. So if anybody wants to reach out individually uh, to have a conversation or get more in, um, information about any of these specific policies or topics I've talked about, please uh, feel free to do so. And um, uh, yeah, just really um, thrilled that uh, the League of Women Voters is interested in criminal justice reform and am so grateful for the opportunity to share um, my perspective about it. And, um, you know, um, so thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can't adequately applaud uh, these days, but okay. Well, I, uh, I think that's it then. Anything else, Jennifer? Or... No? All right. Well, have a good evening and uh, I'll get those materials out to everybody. Thanks, Ben. Thank Thanks, you. Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Lois. Mm -hmm. Good night, everybody. Good night.